This podcast contains explicit language. Holy Maird. This episode of Dorking Out is brought to you by The Daily Planet, Metropolis's oldest and most respected newspaper, with seven editions a week, plus the famous Daily Planet Sunday edition. Get your news straight from the source. Houston flight is go. Myla, oh, let's go. SPM. From Assignment X, the SoniaShow.com, and Amalgamated Storytelling, this is the Dorking Out Show, the podcast for people who love stories from movies, TV, books, podcasts, and everywhere else. Welcome to episode 101 of Dorking Out. This is the Superman the Movie Deep Dorking Edition. With me today is my co-host, Emmy Award winning filmmaker and nerd author, Christopher Allen Smith. Hello, Sonia Mansfield. Hello. With me today is my co-host, professional writer and author of The Sonia Show, the aforementioned Sonia Mansfield. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. In this episode, we're going to do a deep dorking out on 1978 Superman the Movie, starring Christopher Reeve, Margot Kidder, Gene Hackman, Glenn Ford... And two stars spanning the movie ages, Marlon Brando as Superman's Kryptonian father, Jor-El, and little rascals, Jackie Cooper as Perry White, editor of The Daily Planet. Directed by Richard Donner and scored by what might be my favorite John Williams score of all time, Superman is the first big budget comic book movie and is still seen as the model for making a comic book movie right on the silver screen. That's right down to Wonder Woman last year was still quoting huge swaths of Superman. We're going to get into what this movie means to us, how it fares as we surf through the age of comic book movies here in the 2000 teens And consider the question, is this John Williams' greatest score of all time? The movie. Joining us to talk about it is a voice that you may know. He's my favorite living critic, an accomplished and much sought after movie music writer, and host of the new podcast, Bond of Geekdom, Jeff Bond. So, Jeff, you are our guest. What has Superman the movie... Not to be confused with Superman, the forensic accounting firm of Dayton, Ohio, LLC. Mean to you. Uh, Well, not to date myself uh, too much, but I was, let's say, a young adult uh, when I saw Superman in uh, theaters in 1978. Um, And I've, I've... uh, I've heard it. This, a friend of mine, uh, and I don't know who originated this idea, but it, he describes uh, Superman as like steel magnolias for men. Uh, <laughs> it's a very emotional movie, I think, for for some uh, men or maybe just geeks, male geeks. I I, I don't know, but but. It, there's something about it. Uh, I, I remember I, I was, uh, for one thing, I was, a, you know, obviously um, I'm a huge fan of movie music and John Williams and uh, the whole opening of the movie with the the, the black and white um, uh, vision of the Daily Planet building and the the the, the kid narrating it and the music that was playing and the, the whole introduction into this the incredible title sequence uh, it practically had me in tears you know from the just watching it the first time and there's a lot about Superman that is <laughs> almost uh, undealable <laughs> for people, uh, you know, uh, totally unrelatable, I think, for a lot of people watching it now from this perspective of what movies are like now. The whole first 30 minutes on Krypton, I think, uh, is a tough slog for people. <laughs> and I think al- almost all of the Lex Luthor and Otis stuff. Uh, you know, even at the time, I think people were kind of conflicted about that. And and within a few years after, you know, Superman 2 came out, I think in particular, people started thinking, well, why wasn't, you know, not Lex Luthor uh, 
you know, this dark, p- powerful guy. He, you know, he never he never seemed like a real uh, threat to Superman. Um, but you know, in co- the context of watching the film, uh, when I originally saw it, none of that really occurred to me. I thought the Krypton stuff was epic. Uh, I even like Marlon Brando as, as Jor-El. And uh, I found enough of uh, Gene Hackman uh, as Lex Luthor funny that I could get past the, the you know, Miss Tashmacher and Otis stuff. I, I found it kind of, of charming and it clearly came out of, of the, you know, kind of Batman, uh, it's 1966 era that there was no template for making a comic book movie other than that. So Superman was an evolution from the total screwball, uh, goofiness of something like the Batman TV series into something that was taking the idea of Superman, at least very, very seriously. Um, so, and there's a to me, Superman is the key to the entire appeal for me of of superhero movies. And it is to, not to get too heavy, uh, but it it's religious for me. To me, it is it's a stand in for, um, I think, some of the feelings people associate with religion, which is, it's kind of the hope that there's something larger than you that's going to rescue you from death. Uh, so the, 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 all the most powerful moments for me in Superman are of just Superman, just rescuing people. Uh, and that, that whole first rescue scene of him and Lois Lane that's right out of, uh, you know, kind of Irwin Allen disaster movies like, you know, Towering Inferno, where you see somebody uh, on the top floors of a burning building. And the excitement is that you're going to watch them die right. and that you're going to, uh, you know, kind of relate to that on some kind of visceral level because you as the viewer don't want to die. And you, rec- you, you so you can relate to someone not wanting to. And you sort of go through this cathartic, you know, uh ordeal of 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 watching people die and and uh relief at the end of the movie that you're not the one who who died right um but it and and you know intrinsically that there's not some supernatural force that's going to save you from death uh even whether just in the form of an accidental death or your your inevitable you know mortality uh, we sort of know uh, logically that we're we're all going to die and that that we're not going to be saved. So, the, wh- when you're watching this su- this literally supernatural figure swooping in uh, and saving Lois Lane from what appears to be a totally inevitable hor- horrific death, uh, there is something uh, just. Uh, indescribable to me about that that feeling and it's it's very very emotional and it 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 goes down to him you know rescuing a cat later in the movie it's just uh christopher reeve's performance is uh, to me one of the greatest kind of expressions of just ultimate goodness uh that i've ever seen in a movie and they kind of create an atmosphere around him where they can sort of make fun of that and have people needling him about how he's such a goody two shoes. Uh, but you, you still completely believe in him, uh, and in his honesty and, uh, the fact that he just wants to help people. There's just so many little moments. There's, you know, in the middle of, a all the kind of special effects towards the end where he flies in and, uh, rescue some people where this dam is about to uh, uh, be overrun by water and cr- crumble and be destroyed. He goes down into this power station and he like he rescues one guy and then he's like, "Is that man all right?" You know, it's it, right. he's just kind of looking out for everybody. There's so I think that was one of the ge- ingenious touches um, that Richard Donner put in, into the movie and also people reacting to him. All the people on the streets watching the first rescue of Lois Lane. Um, it's such a huge deal when he, when Superman appears and uh, th- 
that is, um, I think, an incredible accomplishment of the movie. It, it, some of it is the music. Uh, uh, John Williams punctuates the scene that builds up the anticipation for the appearance of Superman with that that kind of rhythmic uh, figure in his music, right. which we will um, definitely and get into. Soon. The the, yeah. the photography, um, the cinematography is, is brilliant. The the you know he's lit and posed and just shot, directed, and performed, so you completely believe. Uh, in in the character and the, you know the the um, you know famously the kind of uh, uh, promotional tagline for the movie was you will believe a man can fly and the the, the flying sequences are at best you know adequate to <laughs> right. the task uh, but you the you believe them because of of uh, Christopher Reeve's body language and his expression, he completely kind of wills you into believing that this guy is, is flying and that, that he, he is who he is. Um, so it's a movie I can go back to over and over again. I still get exactly the same. I, you know, I'm like choked up through almost the entire movie. Um, right. And uh, and uh, interestingly, the second movie is uh, was a, a little bit more highly regarded, and I remember hating the second movie. Really? Uh, yes. From even, the opening e- moment, even back I then, you to, were a uh, skeptical, clear-eyed critic. That's a that's well. That I, I remember <laughs> seeing it with my my best friend. We both loved the first movie, and then with the opening uh, kind of s- sequence where they. A bomb breaks the characters out of the phantom zone. They had this kind of terrible animation effect. Right. And we, my friend and I just looked at each other and we're just like, what is this shit? <laughs> uh, and, and then uh, I wound up liking that movie much better seeing the original Donner cut of it because I hated all the kind of slapstick uh, that, that um, the other director who kind of took over for uh, Donner, Richard Lester, I believe. Yeah, Richard Lester, who's a fine director, and uh, who made uh, his Three Musketeers movies are a couple of my favorite movies. Yeah. And he did but, Hard Day's Night. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's a, there's no he was no slouch as a director, but I think that he was the wrong person to do Superman because he didn't love the character the way Donner did, and he didn't. I don't think he believed in 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 uh, Superman the way Donner did, um, and that's the Donner's kind of belief in the character. I think is the key to the whole first movie, and it's I think it's tragic because they had an actor who was perfectly capable of playing this character over a series of movies, and they could have made a series of epic movies, and instead they just get <laughs> less and less epic and more and more dumb. As they go along, right. um, and it sounds of, like you don't like the third one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, yeah, that's a. Uh, I, I like one. Yeah, if thing. you don't like slapstick, I've yes. got some bad news that's for right. you. That I mean, I sort of I knew that that was going to be bad. I went. I think I went and saw that movie alone for some reason. And I just remember just cringing through the whole yeah. wacky opening of it. It has one. Line you probably that I couldn't like. get anyone to go with you because yeah, because it was <laughs> Superman three. <laughs> but I, the 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 one thing I like in that movie is when Robert Vaughn says, uh, "I asked you to kill Superman, and you couldn't even do that one little thing." <laughs> <laughs> so, so Sonia, that, that's funnier than anything that, that Richard Pryor does in that movie. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So Sonia, I watched this yeah. yesterday. <laughs> And I have to – one of the reasons that I love having Jeff on the show, we love having Jeff on the show, is because sometimes he cuts right to the heart of something with from a perspective that I've never even thought about. Steel Magnolias for Men hits <laughs> it perfectly. Every word of what Jeff just said perfectly – relates to me i was you know nearly crying watching it the inspiration and the emotional impact of this movie uh still hits me like a ton of bricks i think it always will i am shocked at how similar this movie is to a marvel movie and the the marvel tone but i'd like to ask you what does superman mean to you and what do you think it 
you know, looking at Superman from the perspective of us living within this blizzard of comic book movies now, how how did you've recently re- rewatched Superman? How does it strike you? I love it. And I think the reason I love this movie, it's not because I grew up watching it, I although I did grow up watching it. I have over the years really grown to appreciate Christopher Reeves Superman. Right. And what he does, like there first of all, what Jeff said, there is like a perfect combination of music and performance in this movie that makes him so heroic. And you believe him always. And but this movie rests on Christopher Reeve. Like Superman can be really boring because he's very powerful. And it's like, well, what's exciting about that? He'll always win. He'll always do the right thing. But he makes Superman and Clark Kent so charming and so likable that I just love watching him. Ooh. And and I love Margot Kidder as Lois Lane. I think she's really good. I like that she's – my husband and I were talking about this last night. I like that she's a woman and not like a, a girl. Yes. Does that make sense? No, that makes total <laughs> sense. And that's like one she's of the, a grown. Yeah. She's a grown up with a life, you know, not a. And a fantastic penthouse apartment. That's yeah, because right. that's what ju- journalists we just break in the box. Well, well, that was the thing. This totally was this was back an apartment in, like that. This was back in an era when journalists had ground crews for the helicopters that they had on the roofs of their buildings. This was right. two or three eras of journalism ago. I was I was shocked at how lush the Daily Planet's uh, right. budget was. Well, and I'm. By the way, I I super love the helicro- the helicopter crash sequence and the like you've got me who's got you yep. yes. line and like it rewatching it I was struck by how <laughs> not a lot happens in this movie. Like every movie now is there's like a huge clusterfuck of CGI at the end. Right. And this is not that. Right. Like a lot of the movie nothing really happens. Like he, you know, his father dies, he gets a job, he flies around with Lois Lane. And that, you know, meanwhile, Lex Luthor and Otis are walking around with that music like, like, you know, they're no real threat, as Jeff pointed out. And then at the end, like everything, like some stuff happens. But even then, like, I don't think it's as exciting as the helicopter crash sequence we watched earlier. Right. Yeah, it's more uh, kind of just like standard. It's like, you know, outtakes from Earthquake. Right. Uh, but but I'll tell you what I love about the Lex Luthor character. I, it, that character comes up under so much criticism for not being, you know, a, 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 a good match for, for Superman in, in terms of being a threat. But I think he's a brilliant uh, – opposition for superman morally because superman is all about like innocence he's about just pure goodness and care you know caring about people and uh to me uh hackman's luthor is like nixon he he's uh he's totally just so much about his own selfish interest that he doesn't care if people get killed. It's literally not even on his radar. Right. Uh, it, it, to the point, it will, he'll, he'll crack a joke about it. Um, and, and so that to me, that contrast between them is brilliant because it, Luthor is someone that, that Superman can't even understand. He he's so and, and, you know, Superman's already sort of like he's fought, he's fought crime, you know, within his first few nights in Metropolis. So he does talk to Luthor sort of as a criminal and talks about locking him up. But at the same time, when he's confronted with this, you, you can tell that it's literally just almost beyond his comprehension that there's someone this petty. Uh, right. And I, I think that that. It, the, and that kind of also makes the stakes of uh, the destruction uh, that's happening towards the end of the movie 
even greater because it's something that didn't have to happen. It, it, it's something that that is just totally the fallout from someone's real estate deal. And uh, I, I just love that. Um, and I and I love the the um, I love the way they play Superman's father figure is I was thinking about like how much effort they put into the whole uh, uh, father scenes in the new Superman man of steel and how they make no sense. Uh, And, and they put all this effort into like uh, Superman's father telling him like he can't reveal himself to people and stuff. Um, And and you're watching this scene where he like, like lets himself be killed by a tornado uh, so Superman won't rescue a dog or something. I don't know what's going on in this. It's incomprehensible, yeah. but you watch that scene with with um, uh, Superman's father in Kansas in the original film. It takes up like something like a minute or two of screen time and Glenn Ford just complete with just a few of these kind of muttered lines of his completely sets up uh what the morality of of superman is yeah and then uh and even though the ending of the movie is another thing a lot of people hate that he you know he turns back time and uh kind of erases this whole uh, jeopardy that happens at the end of the movie i the the fact that he does it for a, a, that he makes a dramatic decision to go against his real father's advice about you know changing history uh, all, all because he loves this woman i think is is fantastic and it's a perfect ending for the movie uh so the, the the original film i think was able to do things so simply but they are so much more effective than what you see in in like the <laughs> the newer dc movies uh, it's like these people uh, i don't know who like is it david goyer or who these writers are it's like do, do these people have relatives do they have families do they know anything <laughs> about like what it's like to have a relationship relationship with a person yeah uh, the, so like you know uh, oh our our moms had the same name <laughs> you know yeah like, yeah it really resonates with me uh, <laughs> I, I remember all the the you know uh times i got choked up in my life because uh, some, someone's mom had the same name as mine it, 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 right. it, it just like they just were able to do things in such a more straightforward, effective way in the original movie, despite all of the, you know, the kind of nonsense that, you know, the, on Krypton and and uh, the a lot of the Lex Luthor comedy stuff. There's a there's a lot of nonsense in the movie, but I don't think that it detracts from the basic feelings that you get out of it and how you relate to the characters. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, I I. I have to really agree with you. And that's the thing that I watching it yesterday. I did f- see the age. I did feel the distance between then and now and how big movies are made. But even despite that, there's so much in this movie. It's, it's that it still works so well, still works at this elemental archetypal level that is just, it's fantastic. It's, you know, every time for all of the bumbling, stumbling stuff going on with um, Lex Luthor and uh, Otis and all that, the kind of quippy back and forth between Tessmacher and Luthor and all that, you can see a lot of, in a weird way, kind of Tony Stark and the, the rhythms of language and the quick little jokes that fly by you that are still used today. And, you know, yeah, I, I, I hear you, and I, I, I'd like to definitely agree with your mention of Luther as kind of the mirror, the negative image of Superman as a personality. Because one of the creepiest things that I, I had kind of forgotten about, but one of the cruelest things I think I've ever seen a movie villain do happens in this movie kind of near the absurd end where Superman's got this, you know, kryptonite around his neck. He's drowning – uh, we've, it's been established that Mrs. Tessmacher's mom lives in Hackensack and, uh, Luther's going to destroy Hackensack and he's kind of walking away. Superman's dying. He's off to the next thing. Ms. Tessmacher says, but my mom lives in Hackensack. And all he does is he looks at his watch, looks at her, shakes his head and then just walks off. And yeah. It is so um, cool yeah, I mean, Hackman and funny is, uh... and weird. 
Yeah. Hackman was no slot. You know, he was one of the biggest stars around at the time that he was cast. And, and you know, Gene Hackman and, and Marlon Brando were cast well before Christopher Reeve was, was cast. They were the ones who were kind of the guarantors of, of that movie's uh, marketing. Right. Um, so but but uh, Gene Hackman is like a, you know, it, it, it's a broad performance, but with a lot of really subtle moments. I mean, I love uh, <laughs> when, you know, Superman smashes the door down to his <laughs> lair and he's like, it's open. Yeah. That's right. My attorneys will be in touch with you about the cost of the door. Right. Uh, and uh, <laughs> he's uh, he's fantastic. And, and like what you were talking about earlier, that, the, the, you know, it was um, a lot of the inspiration from the newsroom scenes were like you know screwball his girl friday right. comedy so I, I love that whole yeah. opening where she's like shaking up the soda and he's like trying to oh the physical comedy in those scenes and uh uh yeah. the, it's it's really really funny the timing and the the way it's edited Definitely. uh it's it's a yeah, christopher technically- reeve christopher reeve said he based his performance on carrie grant mm-hmm. right in like his girl Friday and bringing a baby his role yeah. and when he plays Clark Kent, which I and think he was, you could totally see. He was the first guy to figure out a character way of, of playing Clark Kent uh, instead of just having him be quiet and, you know, Superman talk a little bit louder. There used to be a cartoon of super. I just, and they, I think that this guy used to play Superman on radio and, it would always he'd have a vo- vocal transition, you know, from Clark Kent. It would be like, "This is a job for Superman." <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. I've listened to some of those. <laughs> but so yeah, so we figured out a way to you know that because the Clark Kent character was always just like, "Oh, let's just like you know." can we get Clark Kent out of here so we can get to Superman? Right. Uh, and he figured out a whole way of approaching that. So those scenes are just as entertaining. And, and, you know, just like, when you think about the fact that, that one of the most entertaining scenes in the movie is just Superman having that interview with Lois Lane, uh, you know, them just sitting there talking and you are you're just completely riveted it's like this woman is talking to superman what would you ask superman if you were right. if you were talking to superman it's they just thought of everything you know you could want outside of you know superman flying to another planet or superman you know lifting 50 buildings or all the stuff that they would be doing in movies today right um, where it's, it's much more interesting to actually spend time with Superman as a character, I think. Well, you know what? That's definitely watching this again. And I don't, you know, sometimes when people get to our age, they look back at the movies and I people think in their thirties, you mean right. people in their thirties, people in their early thirties, um, right. They, you know, they they think about the movies from their childhood and they kind of get these nostalgia glasses on and don't really see them as clearly as they should or how they hold up. And, you know, I, I think for my love of this movie, there is that factor. But then there's also the factor of there is an unapologetic drive from everyone in this movie to make the movie entertaining. It's got really serious it's got a lot of laughs it's got a lot of levity it's got a lot of seriousness it's got it's it's like it plays the entire um keyboard of emotions and movies these days seem to really get especially the current dc crop and even as much as i love the christopher nolan batmans and i do they seem to be much more truncated much more tight much more confined and i i have a suspicion that if somebody was able to make and i think we saw this a little bit with wonder woman if somebody was able to make a modern superhero movie that ha- you know has the slow scenes be as entertaining as the action scenes it would make 3 billion dollars you know it just seems i'm i'm kind of flabbergasted at how in a weird way storytellers in hollywood have regressed from telling these kinds of stories. Yeah. Even when we live in an era where their ability to tell these stories is completely within their grasp now. Well, remember uh, the uh, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies were all written by Alvin Sargent, you know, is the guy who I think wrote like 
ordinary people or something. You know, this was like a venerable old screenwriter, and they were trying to bring a little bit more. I don't think it was always successful, but uh, and uh, you know, uh, it's it's Richard Mankiewicz, so whoever did the script for Superman, yeah, Tom Mankiewicz, Tom Tom Mankiewicz, Mankiewicz? yeah. Uh, I don't know that he was that old, but when he did this, I would think he was at least in his thirties. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, between directors and writers that they're, they're too young. The, the, the Mm. studios are trying to get people they can afford, uh, and the the kind of the cheapest talent they can get to knock out some of these things. And they're people who don't have life experience and they don't know how to construct these scripts. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I definitely, think there's a lot to be said for that and i'm yeah and and it's funny re-watching this yesterday even though there are aspects of the man of steel and the dc movies that i like it's just more and more baffling what is going on with these things you know um i do want to say also one thing i did notice i'm glad that you mentioned sam raby's spider-man because it is insane how much Sam Raimi stole the Daily Planet scenes, rhythm for rhythm, point for point, yep. for um, the Daily Bugle scenes. It was just like it was not. There was no homage. <laughs> there was no whatever. Was pretty, it was. I think it was, he was straight pretty upfront theft. about the fact that he was very inspired by the the Donner Superman. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that they had that feeling. I mean, I was just thinking of like the. Just there's so many tiny little moments in the first Superman movie that are so fun and so funny. Like the just like the scene where Superman's waiting for the elevator, you know, right before the helicopter scene, and right. where Clark Kent is, and it's like going down. It's like no, going up, going up, up, up. <laughs> the, the, there's just like and the, there's all sorts of lines by just walk on characters that are, are no you know you would never see this in a movie now where you're you know we hired this actor we need a you know to give a full performance we're not going to give a line to some nobody right uh, so these character these movies don't have as big a life because they don't their corners aren't filled with little you know uh, tiny characters that have like this amazing moment of life for maybe just a second or two. Exactly. Or they got you know the 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 pimp who's like, "Wow, it's a bad outfit!" Right. <laughs> exactly. There was even you couldn't get away with today well, for all sorts of reasons, but right. it, it, it's just funny. It it like makes a more complete world because you see the whole you know right. planet kind of react to right. Superman. Exactly. Well, I mean that's the thing is there was that weird moment. Another, you, you know, you're right about filling the whole world because there's that weird moment where Superman saves the cat, gives it to the girl, the girl goes in, tells her mom, and you hear all this, right? And then the girl's mom starts hitting her, yep, because it's it's just like <laughs> yeah, that, that, that doesn't that doesn't age well. It doesn't age well, <laughs> but at the same time, anybody that grew up in that era, you know. I don't know about yeah. you guys. Maybe it was some neighborhoods I was growing up in. You know, there was, you know, a certain percentage of your friends at school had to step real carefully at home, you know, and 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 not shying yep. away from that and coloring that in a little bit was just fantastic. But Jeff, <coughs> excuse me, Jeff, one of the big reasons I wanted to have you on the show for this specific episode, and I appreciate everything you've said so far, I have a question that I want to throw out to both of you. John Williams, mm-hmm. I would say, he's the Beatles of movie score music. He is the best. He is the one, two, three, four, five slot of the greatest of all time music composers, I would say. You might disagree. I don't know. We'll, we'll get into that here in a second. But is Superman, every time I listen to this, you know, because I listen to a lot of soundtracks, every time I listen to this one, there's something about it. Even Otis's theme is this beautiful, lush, fully realized theme that hits his character. It's just there's something about this score that I think – is this his best score? I I think you can make a very good argument for that. Uh, it was – it's at the peak of his uh, kind of biggest period of creativity. It came – you know, right after Star Wars is – that's kind of the first uh, epic symphonic scale score that he wrote. And I think that he kind of took all of the, everything he learned doing star Wars 
and uh, even even close encounters and kind of fused it into this uh, work where he perfectly characterized uh, Superman. And it, it, there's so many elements to – there's two or three kind of melodies for Superman. There's one that's like – to me is – related just to his like power there's one that's kind of linked to his patriotism uh and and just kind of his general goodness and then there's that rhythm which is it kind of you know creates anticipation for his mm. appearance and, yes. and, and 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 you know adds to the the feeling of power when he when he's uh flying and doing things and uh it's got one of the most gorgeous love themes that he ever wrote uh, so it, it, and it, 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 every moment of the movie that it works in, it, it completely, uh, adds to and, and strengthens what's going on. It makes you, it makes you believe even more in the character. Yes, definitely. So that's exactly right. What? That's, I, I, I would yeah. immediately, I was like, well, it's Superman or like Indiana Jones, like Raiders. Right. The idea of the theme the song, the music playing into the character. Right. And I, I think that's, I think that's the thing with me is that I, and I agree with you a hundred percent, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark is definitely one of the best themes, but like there are so many moments within Superman. And I think Jeff right. just laid them out. Great. Where I have, there's entire soundtracks worth of fantastic movie that I've forgotten in Superman soundtrack because the top line three or four themes are so over the top amazing well um, he but, has this great you know great theme for for krypton right. th- and his scoring of uh you know uh marlon brando making that speech you know where, when he's sending the the kid off which probably uh, that scene would not have would have been completely forgettable without that music underneath that and then the you know all the music in kansas is incredible americana music that just makes uh, that all those sequences seem completely mythic yeah uh, and uh you know and then he creates the whole love relationship uh with lois lane to, and to the point where when he's you know flying around the world and kind of going back in time that theme is you know playing over that and playing over those rhythms and you know telling you that the whole reason he is going back in time is for her uh so it it's yeah it, it's um it, you know it's one of the craziest uh title sequences ever done for a movie uh right. and uh it, it's um there's yeah there's just so much to it that there every cue in it is kind of a standalone terrific piece of music and it just shows how you know integral he was to that whole period of of, of movie making and he's he still is uh you know a very important composer but we're we're in, that was at the point just after dolby sound had been uh, invented and and uh, there's a great quote from Danny Elfman where he said that before Do- Dolby Sound, uh, music was really responsible for about 50 percent of the impact of a given movie, and after Dolby Sound, it's more like maybe 20 percent at best. Uh, and you know, John Williams was right in on that period. That's Star Wars was the first big Dolby sound movie. And he had to create music that was so big that it could compete with all of those incredible sound effects. Uh, and it was similar in, uh, in Superman and close encounters and empire strikes back all the movies in late seventies, early eighties, you had these spectacular scores because of Star Wars, because people were trying to imitate Star Wars. And there's certainly, uh, uh, you can argue a lot that there's a, a lot of imitation of Star Wars in the in the Superman score. He practically goes into you know uh, his uh, Force theme right when you're when he's introducing Krypton. Um, but uh, he really kind of reinvented this whole genre of you know epic symphonic film scores, and during that period, they were really pushing 
the movie as much as as sound effects and even special effects that because you know the special effects in superman are are good for the time but they were not groundbreaking um and uh they i I think that williams music had to help sell the illusion uh particularly in the flying scenes uh, which it does beautifully right sonia yes looking back at all the marvel discussions and comic book discussions and revisiting Superman here. Is there anything else that you would like to say? Any other thoughts you have on Superman, your consideration to Superman, your love for Superman from this vantage point? I actually had some trivia for you guys. I would love some trivia. Okay. Are you ready? Hit it. All right. I did some research to find out who was in contention to play Superman. This Do you guys cr- already know all this stuff? I know uh, some of it, but it's a crazy it, yeah. list. <laughs> and it but, is, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Spit it out there because so it's here, insane. So here, here's like four people that they apparently offered Superman to. They offered it to Dustin Hoffman, <laughs> which makes that, that me laugh. Was, that was Lex Luthor though, right? Or was it? And it was both. Oh, like, right. Have right. your pick. Oh, apparently. That, that's right. They, uh, Robert Redford, Warren Beatty, and Burt Reynolds. Right. Right. I think Cl- uh, Clint Eastwood was also in the running. Right. Um, I, and then apparently yeah. they auditioned like 200 people. And then some of the people who auditioned were Schwarzenegger. Right. And James Kahn. And James Kahn said they offered him the role, but and I don't know said- if that's. Uh, yeah, I just can't wear that suit. Apparently, was his quote saying he's right. going to do it. Um, yeah, uh, Bruce Bruce Jenner, right. right at the time. James James Brolin, Christopher Walken, John Voight, and Nick Nolte. <laughs> oh my god! Wow. Oh, and Chris Christopherson and Richard Gere, and apparently Stallone really lobbied for the part, and they were like, "Um, no." Right. Um, and apparently, <laughs> I didn't know this until today. You know, this is. Uh, I, this could be Wikipedia talking. I don't know. Patrick Wayne, John Wayne's son, right, was cast, but then when John Wayne got cancer, he ejected. I think uh, there might be footage of, of Patrick Wayne playing the role on some of the DVD extras, and oh, wow. uh, they they show other people uh, auditioning for um, Lois Lane too, and. Right. Uh, one, I, I can't think of the name of the actress. She's a famous Broadway like comedian actress uh, who I really like and who like Burn visually it. is perfect for it. Uh, but she played it so kind of like like she was so much smarter than Clark Kent uh-huh. that it totally just would not have worked. She might have even died. Maybe she did it with Patrick Wayne. I can't remember. But it just, you know, it's amazing that they got who they got. I mean, physically, you couldn't possibly get any closer to the look of Superman than, than you know, Christopher Reeve's face. Right. Um, And then to add to that, like you would think that they would find somebody, okay, this guy looks perfect uh, and we'll just deal with them, you know, (laughs) like we don't. And you would be lucky to get anybody who could do any kind of a performance. And the fact that they got someone who looked, you know, so perfect for the role and then was able to embody the character so perfectly, I think is miraculous. They got so lucky. Oh, my God. yeah. Yeah. And, and his chemistry with with uh, Margot Kidder, too, is is just completely per. When you see that you know their screen test together and compare it to like how those two characters were working with the other actors, no no one was anywhere near uh, what they needed to be and and what they finally got out of those right. actors. It's it it is amazing to to look at and and for anybody that's interested, we'll put the link to a John Williams score at Spotify and b the Wikipedia page to look at all the different ways this movie could have gone off the rails. It's kind of like there were five hundred paths that would take them to a train wreck, like Batman yeah. and Robin, and three paths that would take them to a fantastic movie, and they 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 chose the three paths. You know the the filming. Superman 1 and Superman 2 back to back that had never been done before that it's it's 
crazy that they. Well, it was done with the uh, Three Musketeers, right. uh, but yeah, it had never been done with a, a comic book. Oh, right, movie. right. That's right. And uh, but that's why the you know that's what was sort of the Saul Kinds thing, and right. they, they they were the you know kind of production sort of geniuses behind like getting the movie and the deal put together. But the, I think if they had been left to their own devices, they would have come up with a terrible movie. Uh, and it was it was Richard Donner and, and Tom Mankiewicz who really kind of got the tone uh, figured out for it. Definitely, because I mean that's and that that is the thing that you know we hear a lot of stories in entertainment about this person contributed that that person contributed this. We can never really know in the mix what happened. I think it's pretty clear that once you see Richard Donner plucked out of this equation, and you go from Superman one to the Superman 2 that was released in theaters, to Superman 3, to Superman Mm -hmm. 4, The Quest for Peace, it's pretty clear who is responsible for not doing things well and who is responsible for the amazing quality for the first one. Um, Do you have any more trivia, Sonia, or any more thoughts? Nope. I'm all good. All right. (laughs) So, Jeff, is there anything else that you would like to say before we wrap this up? No, but I, I, it's interesting uh, because I, a, I have a friend of mine uh, who just had posted something about Superman about how he'd watch, and he had told me this a few years ago that he watched it with his son, and his son hated it, and so he wound up hating it. Oh no! Uh, even though it, 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 and he just was just posting on Facebook. It's, it's got a few nice touches, but really, it's an awful movie. Oh. And I, I just said, I just said, you know, I'm sure glad I can still like things. I, I, I can see I can look back at this movie and I can totally see, OK, here's some place where like a millennial is not going to be get this. Uh, there's a lot of things, you know, that even I thought were, were awkward at the time, but I can still go back and watch that movie anytime and get exactly the same great feelings that I got. You know, when I originally uh, saw it and I, I think it's you know, there's no doubt it's useful to to go back and look at what you loved as a kid and be able to see what was flawed about it. And sometimes it's terrible. I, you know, uh, you know, Johnny quest was like my favorite cartoon when I was a kid, I still love it as a piece of, you know, kind of pop art uh, animation, but it, it was very uh, jingoistic and kind of racist in the terms of it's all its villains being, you know, Asians, Mexicans, uh, or, you know, uh, African tribesmen and stuff. So you, it, you certainly can look back and see where this things like this are problematic, but uh, I, I think you ought to be able to go back and see why things made you feel the way they did, you know, when you're a kid and still be able to enjoy some of that. Exactly. Thank you. That's a well, great way to end. I'm sorry to hear about your friend's cold, dead too. heart. <laughs> yeah, right. me too. Like things. If, Liking if things. Only we Give could, it a try. If only we could relate to a failed real estate deal resulting in something <laughs> horrible happening on a countrywide <laughs> oh, scale. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> See, he's of the relevant. He's ruining See, everything. It, All right, it's still timely. <laughs> and they both have hair happened. problems. So. <laughs> there you go. It's all, it's all there. All right. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for this deep dive into Superman. Sonia, is there anything that you would like to say before we say goodbye? No, I'll just say goodbye. Bye!